Okay, um, so module three, um, we've seen all these slides. Uh, we're going to introduce you now to neural networks or artificial neural networks. Actually, I'm going to interrupt you, Doctor, and I'm going to ask you to restart over. Okay. And, uh, so <laughs> I should have mentioned this before, but when I was just working on some of these videos online and, and a video, and so people are going to skip and, and watch different videos to their leisure. And so they can't start a video and says, oh, you've seen this before, <laughs> right? So yeah, you should go through the, the, the uh, Creative Commons before each slide deck. Okay. But assume it's a new video that it's the first time somebody's watching you. All right. Okay. So welcome to the Canadian Bioinformatics Workshops on Machine Learning. Um, this workshop is um, aligned with the uh, Creative Commons attribution share alike uh, license so people can share and share alike according to um, Creative Commons license. So today we're going to be talking about neural networks or artificial neural networks. And we're going to give you a little bit of an introduction. Just in terms of timing, we've got about an hour and a half scheduled for this one. Uh, it might be a little long, uh, so I'll try and move quickly. So neural networks are essentially derived from our understanding of biology and neurons. And so I'm going to try and relate that information to the architecture behind neural networks and, and then explain how they evolved and how they were developed. Some of the key concepts with neural network algorithms, this idea of one hot encoding, which I introduced earlier, um, back propagation and the idea of hidden layers and the need to uh, have these to, to perform uh, discrimination and decision. Uh, we're gonna look at the Python code for an artificial neural network for iris classification. So in the previous lecture, we looked at uh, iris classification using decision trees. We're gonna show how you can do the same thing with artificial neural networks and we're gonna compare the two between ANNs and decision trees. So an artificial neural network or an ANN essentially is a way of, of simulating the function activity of the brain uh, with simulated or synthetic neurons, which are those circles, and um, axons, which are those lines. Uh, as most of you would know, neurons are connected to each other through, through axons and uh, uh, this connectivity actually is the reason why we are able to think and rationalize. Um, they are artificial neurons, which is why we call them artificial neural networks. Um, they were modeled after the concepts um, originally seen in the human brain and also analysis of, of other mammalian brains. I've told you before that you can use it for both regression and classification. Um, they have been used in supervised uh, learning. They can also be used in unsupervised classification. Um, ANNs are really described in detail in 1986. And as I said, they mimic the way that the uh, brain works. Layers of neurons are connected. And because of the connectivity, and I'll explain this a little later, it's possible to do a variety of logic operations, um, which are essential for doing pattern analysis. Now, to si simulate um, a brain, uh, we actually don't you know, create chips and put wires from chip to chip. What the computer does is it just converts the neuron locations and connections to basically tables or arrays or matrices. So all those connections that we saw in that diagram with nodes and, and edges, those just become numbers and positions in an array. So this keeps it sort of mathematical or virtual, and that makes it obviously a lot easier to, to code. So on the left side, we're showing you know, a real brain um, with the typical neurons and um, electrical signals being sent out from the neuron down the axons. Uh, on the right is sort of the, the synthetic brain where we've got neural connections, and below is this synthetic model of um, neurons and edges, nodes and edges uh, to mimic um, neurons and, and axons. Now, this is actually illustrating, um, these are the hand-drawn diagrams um, from anatomists, but uh, if you had you know, good histology slides, you'd see the same thing. But this is showing the, the neural cortex in a human brain. And you can see uh, with the, the wiring diagrams, the connections between neurons. And 
and people have noticed in general that there are multiple layers in the brain where there's sort of dense collections of neurons, then it's lighter, and then more dense collections, then it's lighter. Um, and that, that layering is something that's been known for probably more than 100 years. Um, typically, it's six layers that they generally see, and um, they are part of the brain where most of the logic and reasoning is done. So this is known, you know, more than 100 years ago, and people also are aware that, you know, much of the thinking in the brain was done through links and connections between neurons and axons. Um, so the way the neuron works um, in, in the brain is that there are little axons called dendrites that collect uh, signals from other uh, related or nearby neurons. Uh, the nucleus, which is sort of the node, if you want, for a neuron, uh, integrates the signals. And then it sends and does the appropriate chemistry, calcium release, and electrical potential generation to send the electrical signals down the nucle down the axon onto other dendrites, which will then connect up to another um, axon or another um, neuron. So this idea of having a, um, a node, which is the cell, and then edges or links, uh, which are either axons or dendrites, is um, you know, something obviously that we know about from neurochemistry. So this accumulation of signals um, coming from other neurons to a central neuron is, is involving essentially integration of, of signals. If those signals reach a threshold, then the neuron will fire and send other signals to related or nearby neurons. And so that idea of integration, signaling, firing, sending information out can be really described as a, as a matrix uh, and a set of interaction nodes. And so the top is sort of a schematic diagram of neurons, and the bottom is essentially a sort of a more mathematical node structure of the same thing. Um, and in many respects, these interactions can be described as uh, Boolean interactions, things that are on and off, ones or zeros. And this too also is sort of behind the reasoning with uh, neural networks. In terms of being able to recognize images, this is one of the great strengths of neural nets. It's also one of the great strengths of the human brain. So we can take a whole bunch of observations and here I've got sort of corrupted numbers of a number eight in a digital form. And most of us, if we looked at those, would sort of realize that those all look like the number eight. And so we'd be able to fill in the missing data. We'd be able to impute or interpret and say, um, yeah, these look like they're sort of slightly corrupted uh, information loss. Um, but with the number eight. So that's, that's sort of image recognition. If we were to do that in an artificial neural network, we would have our training set. And this is sort of the input and output um, part of the concept. And then we would have uh, an input layer and a hidden layer and an output. And so we have essentially kind of like a two layer, if you want, uh, network. Um, and what this neural network is supposed to be able to do is take these corrupted images and spit out the corrected uh, number eight. Um, each of those layers, this input layer, the hidden layer, the output layer, um, are represented by nodes, the circles, and the connections um, are, are essentially weights. These are considered um, the equivalent of our of our axons or dendrites, but they have a certain amount of weight indicating the strength of the signal connecting one node to another or one neuron to another. So connections from nodes to other nodes essentially creates a table of you know, A to B or one to two, two to three, two to one. And those numeric locations can be described as an array or a matrix. Now, conventional neural networks typically have one, two, maybe three layers. Um, with deep learning, uh, the number of layers is much larger, 10 more. Um, and it was only with the development of more advanced computers, faster CPUs, that the deep neural networks or thick neural networks uh, were possible. 
um, before then, or before I guess over in the last 10 years, computer power wasn't quite great enough. And there were other subtleties uh, in terms of the mathematics of neural nets that, that didn't allow for the deep neural nets to be developed. Um, deep learning is, is a really hot area, I think, as I said, and certainly the deeper the, the, the neural nets, the more complex patterns and rules can be learned. And this, again, just mimics the fact that the human brain has at least six layers, probably more, and the human brain is capable of some pretty amazing things. Now, neural nets, uh, even though they were described formally in 1986 by Rommel Hart and McClelland, um, their idea of neural nets um, or mathematical, mathematical modeling of neural nets have been around since the 40s and really emerged uh, from McGill, uh, from people working at McGill and the Montreal Brain Institute. And they are interested in trying to explain or model um, how neurons work. So the threshold logic model um, is uh, this idea that you've got inputs, maybe coming from two different neur neurons or dendrites coming into the neuron, uh, the neuron or neurode, this is the body, and then an output with an axon. So W1 X1 plus W2 X2 equals Y. So this is this um, output. So weighted inputs lead to an output. And um, with this neurode, you could do things like anding or oring, uh, logical multiplication or logical addition. So zero times zero equals zero, zero times one equals zero, one times one equals one, that's anding. And or is zero plus zero equals zero, one plus zero equals one. Uh, one plus one equals two, but because the maximum you can get is one with uh, binary it also equals one. So um, Pitts and McCullough's idea was picked up by Donald Hebb, who was at McGill, and then he realized that if you had a, and also made the observation that if an axon from one cell is close enough to another cell and repeatedly um, excites it, you can enhance um, the activity. There's a, a metabolic change that leads to um, the firing of cell B, which is that star looking cell to increase or enhance its, its signal. So the fact that the weightings could change or the strength of the signal can change, and this is where this idea of W1 and W2, um, they could also enhance or diminish um, signals was something that, that was important both for the mathematics of uh, ANNs, but also or development of, of general perceptron models. So a mathematician named Rosenblatt um, developed um, what's called the perceptron. And this is sort of an extension where it still uses the idea of weighted uh, neurons and they're summed uh, together and the neurode. But in addition to that, there's a, a function that's applied um, to predict or generate the output. And that's what's shown here is a sigmoidal function. Um, and so that either amplifies or depending on, on the level that's coming out, whether it's above or below that threshold. Um, and it will lead to um, a, a, a different signal. So the use of a thresholding function, um, a sigmoidal function was important uh, for the development of, I guess, the precursor to the neural net called the perceptron. So it is a mathematical model of a neuron, it takes input values, it takes weights, adds them, and then passes them through this activation function or this sigmoidal function. So just like um, to the McCullough Pitts model, um, you've got X1, W1, X2, W2, so on. They're all going into the neurode. They're summed together, but then they're multiplied or altered by this activation function. And the activation function is some kind of um, sigmoidal um, or softmax type function. And that gives you the output. Um, so you get the weighted sum, so the inputs and outputs. And then in this case, if we had a step function, it would be if um, 
um, the output equals one if the weighted sum is greater than zero. Uh, and if the weighted sum is less than or equal to zero, um, the output is zero. So you get one or zero. Um, and then the weighted sum can be technically any number between minus a thousand and plus a thousand. So the step function is a way of normalizing things. Uh, in this case, a maximum of one and minimum of zero. Um, but it also can be adjusted and it doesn't have to be a step function. It could be, as I say, sigmoidal or softmax. Um, so the perceptron uh, conceptually was very close to the um, neural net. Um, the idea, and they demonstrated that what you could do with this is you could take data, which was the inputs, um, and uh, it could essentially learn um, by uh, taking the input, looking at the output, comparing the output to what was expected, and comparing the output, um, the difference between the output and, and predicted and the observed, which would be your error. So then taking that difference between observed and predicted output and using that error to modify the weights on these inputs would actually get the perceptron uh, to predict more and more closely so that the error was consistently reduced. So it was uh, essentially a, a cyclic process where inputs, um, produce an output, outputs compared to the, the truth or the gold standard, an error is calculated. The error then is used to modify the weighting on the inputs again. It runs it through again, hopefully it's, it's better. Um, you make another adjustment based on the error, modify, and you repeat and repeat until uh, the minimum error is achieved. And now the perceptron has learned um, certain phenomena or certain features. Um, the actual function is, as I said, the difference between the expected and observed, um, but you can also adjust it according to a learning rate um, and also essentially adjust the, the slope of the uh, error function. So this is essentially the 1950s version of a, a neuron or an artificial neural network. This is describing, in essence, uh, the gradient uh, function. And um, we have an activation function that could be step function, sigmoidal, or linear. Uh, you can calculate the derivative of that. Um, we have the, in this case, alpha, which is the learning rate. That can also be described as uh, eta, or it looks like the letter N, the Greek letter N, but it's, it's a, to, to be eta. Um, the target output uh, is the gold standard. Uh, the actual output comes from the perceptron. And so all of these things from the learning rate, the difference, the, the neurons activation function, um, and the weight of the input um, are used to sort of calculate how you're going to change your weights. So, so there's a mathematical structure to the weight calculation but it's, it's, it's able to change the weights so that the uh, perceptron uh, gets closer and closer to the correct answer. So what the perceptron is able to do is essentially perform logical operations like and and or. So those and or or operations are useful for what are called linear separable um, problems. Um, so it's putting, you know, something on either side of, you know, two categories in a straight line. Um, so in that regard, a perceptron is just a linear combination of inputs. And this is just showing the, the idea of how an AND function works and how an OR function looks. So ANDing is the equivalent of logical multiplication, and it shows how Say if you had two inputs of zero and one um, and versus an input of one and one, you would be able to separate the one comma one point from the zero one and the zero zeros. Or if you used the or, um, you could separate things from zero zero versus zero one one zero and one one. So, you know, it's able to draw, if you want, the hyperplane, it's able to separate things 
uh, in a in a reasonable way. Um, so and and or are critical for any kind of logic. Um, and most of you guys know a little bit about computers and Boolean logic is, is based on and and or. Um, there's obviously a threshold that's used, so we can also have a bias as well, uh, which is marked with the B, and that can also make an adjustments. But this, as I say, is sort of like this step function. It's either one or zero, and that way we can do and or or. Now, if you want to be able to do something a little more complicated, where um, we're not just trying to do a, a linear combination or something that's not linearly separable. If we wanted to be able to do um, measure inequalities or logical differences, you have to use a function, a logic function called exclusive or or x or. Um, so, you know, zero is zero different from zero? No. Is zero different from one? Yes. Is one different from zero? Yes. Is one different from one? No. So the XOR essentially allows you to make distinctions. It also allows you to separate two or more classes, whereas with AND and OR, you can only separate um, um, just one sort of simple linear separable group. So this is illustrated here where we can see um, a class of white circles, zeros and ones and ones and zeros are able to separate whereas the black circles, one, one, and zero, zero, are separable. So essentially we're able to draw two planes to separate things. And, and so this piece of logic, which was realized I think in the 1960s, was absolutely critical for being able to do classification. And so how do you get, how do you go from the perceptron um, to some weighting function that allows you to discriminate? And this is where, the exclusive or actually requires not one layer, but two layers. Um, so we've seen the example of the perceptron where you, you just had inputs going into the one neurode, but now with a perceptron, um, you have inputs coming in and the neurode is identified um, as that one layer. So that issue of exclusive or was identified by Marvin Minsky in 1969. In 1975, uh, Werbos came up with a concept of using uh, hidden layers and black propagation. That idea was promptly forgotten and then resurrected about 15 years later by Rommel Hart and McClellan who developed artificial neural networks. Um, artificial neural networks continued for about 15, 20 years. And then the idea of recurrent artificial neural nets and deep neural nets started emerging in about the late 2012, 2013. And since then it's just taken off. So it's taken 80 years roughly uh, for uh, neural nets to sort of evolve to the point where they're almost ubiquitous. So the original name for a neural network was actually a multi-layered perceptron because it was giving credit to the perceptron that had been developed by Rosenblatt. Um, it's using not just one layer, but two or three or dozens of layers. Um, so at a minimum, a neural net has to have three layers, an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. And those are the neural nets that we're gonna be using today and that we'll describe. Um, and because of these hidden layers, um, the conventional perceptron is able to do and or an exclusive or, uh, and that means it's useful for classification. You can also, uh, in order to train and modify the layers, um, rather than just the, the gradient descent optimization, you use this back propagation, which is sort of an extension of the perceptron uh, gradient calculation. And as I said, the neural nets were really rediscovered, but had been around for a good 30 years before. I'm gonna show a video uh, that uh, I, I found very useful. It's about three or four minutes, just describing neural networks um, and how they work. Uh, so let's see if this works. What's a neural network? A neural network is a type of program that learns how to do things instead of being hand programmed to do things. It's inspired by the neural networks in your brain. Your brain contains around 100 billion cells called neurons. These neurons have dendrites, which they use to receive signals from other neurons. 
and axons, which extend outward to send their own signals to other neurons. When a neuron receives the right mix of signals on its dendrites, it then sends out its own signal on its axon. A neural network in a computer is similar. Here's a very simple one, one that I've written actual code for. It has an input layer and an output layer. There's also a layer in between called the hidden layer. These circles represent the neurons found in your brain. Sometimes they're called neurons here too, but most often they're just called units. To keep the number of units small to fit in this video, I've trained it for something that doesn't need a lot of inputs or outputs. I've trained this one to count. It can count from zero to seven in binary. I could have made it count in decimal, but that would have been boring. If I set the input units to all zeros, then I've taught it to set the outputs like this, 001. That's the number one in binary. If I give it 001, it outputs 010. That's the number two in binary. It does that all the way up until you give it a seven in binary, which is 111. If you give it seven, then it outputs zero. But the fun thing to do is to give it zero to start with. And from then on, you simply take whatever it outputs and feed it back into its inputs. It just keeps on spitting out zero to seven and then keeps repeating, it counts. I've actually embedded the trained neural network into a web page, which I'll talk more about later. Here I give it a two and it spits out a three. And here I tell it to start counting from zero, zero, zero on its own. How do we teach the neural network? When we give it some inputs, some magic has to happen with all the stuff in here that makes it spit out what we want at the outputs. Each connection here has a number associated with it called a weight. There's also something else called a bias unit that has some value, and that's connected to the hidden units and output units, and its connections also have weights. So to get the neural network to produce outputs, we'll take the input values, do math with all these numbers, and if all those numbers are just right, it'll spit out the outputs we want. And all those numbers will, at the same time, be such that it will spit out the correct outputs for all possible inputs. So training a neural network involves adjusting all those weights such that given an input, after doing all the math, it spits out the correct output. To train it to do that, we use something called the backpropagation algorithm. It's called that because first we go one way through the network from input to output, and then propagate back from output to input, adjusting things. We start by making up what's called a training set. The training set consists of the inputs and what we expect as output for each input. So if we give it input 000, we want something close to 001 at the output. For 001, we want something close to 010, and so on. We'd normally give it the first set of inputs from the training set, 000, but that will give us very boring numbers to look at, mostly zeros. So let's assume we've already done some and are on the seventh input, 110. At the start of training, all the weights are just random numbers. I won't go through all the math in detail, but we take the values from the first input unit, a one in this case, multiply it by this first weight going to this hidden unit and store that in the hidden unit. We do the same for all the other input units that are connected to that hidden unit and add their results in too. We also multiply the value of the bias unit by its weight and add that to the hidden unit's value too. We then adjust that using an activation function that among other things, adjust that to be between zero and one. We go across and do the same for all the hidden units. Those values for the hidden units are now the inputs for doing the same with all these weights and this bias unit and its weights. And once we've adjusted the results using the activation function, we finally have the outputs. And the first time we do all this, those outputs are likely nonsense. Now we need to go back through the network and adjust all those weights, such that we'll get a better result the next time. But we have to do it gently because we'll also be adjusting those same weights to work with other inputs too. Remember, our training set included both the possible inputs and the expected outputs. Using the expected output for the input we just used, we can calculate the errors for the outputs. In other words, just how far off were those outputs? We then use that error to go back through the network, adjusting the weights by very small amounts so that we'll get a smaller error the next time we give it that input. And that's why we call it the backpropagation algorithm. We propagate back through the network, adjusting weights. We repeat that whole process for all the inputs and outputs in the training set. And once we've done that for the whole training set, we then repeat it a few thousand times until the error we start getting is very small, small enough that we consider it trained. For this neural network, I have to go through the training set around 680,000 times to get the RMS error to under 0 0.0005. Okay. Um... Guys, I've uh, used this video. What's a neural network?
I've used this video a few times, probably because I think it's, it's really nicely explained. Even though it's a simple example, it, it, it really helps, I think, understand the concepts. And um, for most of you, this is all you really need to understand in terms of the concepts. But we are going to dive into the math a little bit uh, so that you understand how the algorithm works. Um, so um, this is showing the sort of standard architecture uh, that was illustrated in that video by Rimstar. Um, so it's uh, an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. And the number of inputs can be four, or the hidden layer can be five uh, inputs or nodes, and the output can be one. But you can have many other architectures where you could have an input layer that has 100 or 200 units, and the hidden layer could have 100 units, and the output layer could be three or four or 10 units. Um, so architecture varies with neural networks. They are called feed-forward networks because they um, input moves in one direction towards an output. The back propagation is this idea that, that you send signals back to modify um, the weightings and the strength. Um, but there is a directionality to neural networks. The concept of a hidden layer is that layer between the input and the output. So you could have one hidden layer, you could have two hidden layers, three or more. And these um, obviously help modify input. They're critical for being able to calculate uh, exclusive or uh, to be able to do differentiation of, of, of classes or groups, but also for regression. The forward propagation step is that step in the learning where the input is passed through the network and that's where things are multiplied. So this is the perceptron idea where you take the, uh, all the weights, you take the strengths, and then you calculate an output uh, where you've multiplied some thresholding function or activation function. The back propagation part is the way that we correct the error between the output and the um, observed or expected output um, or the true output. Um, and that's where you make adjustments to those nodes, those circles, and you modify their weights. Um, that's in terms of the weight matrices and the biases. Uh, you also saw the term epoch or epoch. Um, that's um, essentially the number of times that you will um, carry out the training and backpropagation um, for a set. You'll repeat it many times, and it's not unusual for a neural network to be trained uh, over minutes, hours, or even days, uh, where there's hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of epochs or epochs that are calculated. Uh, so this each iteration of training is an epoch. Um, many cases, what people have found is that um, Batch learning is better for neural networks. It's sort of learning little things at a time. So when you first learned about addition, you kind of learned how to add one plus one and one plus zero and one plus two. And then the next batch, you kind of started learning about, you know, what's uh, six plus eight. And then the next one, which what's 20 plus 21. So the, the numbers get larger or more complicated. And so in this way, you, you, you break up your training into batches. Um, that process is essentially more efficient for learning rather than dealing with large single batches. So these mini batches are um, uh, one of the tricks that people have found for, for speeding up the learning process, sort of taking things uh, one small bite at a time. So this is a, a model of forward propagation, uh, which is very much like the, the perceptron. Um, so we start with some input. Um, in this case, we've got two hidden layers and an output. Um, so we're taking the weighted sums. So the W is the weighting. Um, we have functions F1, F2. The functions essentially are uh, a weight times um, some value. <coughs> um, so the first one is the function weight times X. The next ones are functions of Ys and we have different uh, output elements. Um, so those are the yi. Uh, what we have is an, a function called e. Uh, so that's the linear combinations of the weights that are w's, and either the inputs, which are x's. Um, so 
Um, this is this is the method of forward propagation. You see it goes from left side to the right side. That's the forward propagation step. What you're also seeing are indices uh, with the weights, um, W, uh, X1, X12. These are connections between um, the, the different uh, tables, so they have indices. So uh, W12 or W24 or W35, um, those represent positions on a, on a table um, or a matrix. And so weighting, we call it a weighting table or a weight matrix. And those are the, the arrows or the connections. So after we've you know, calculated our output as shown in that video, uh, usually we're not very close to the expected or, or, or known output. So at this stage, we calculate the error, which is like what was done in the perceptron. Uh, and then we start making small changes um, to um, the, um, the functions. And so this case, the, the function um, is usually a cost function, uh, which is, uh, Again, it's, it's a number or a function that we've chosen that might be related to a sigmoidal function, which is related to the activation function. Um, it might be another type of cost function, which is cross entropy. Um, so there's any number of cost functions that are used in neural networks. Um, anyways, that error um, is, is these deltas um, or derivatives. Um, are then multiplied by those weight numbers. And so the weights are the W1, W2, W24, W35. Um, and so we can see that instead of going left to right, we're going right to left, and that's the back propagation step. And so those, those errors are propagated through all of the, um, both the functions and the weights uh, with those deltas. So there is uh, typically a derivative that's taken um, and derivatives are how we do gradient descent optimization. Um, so if there's some cross entropy evaluation or some sigmoidal function we're using, we take the, the derivative and that's allowed us to, to determine that error. Um, when we're taking those derivatives, we can determine whether we're in a positive slope or a negative slope. Uh, which direction the weights should be moved, should they be positive weights or negative weights. Um, and so this derivative um, is, is critical for deciding whether to add or subtract values from the weights as we go through the, the back propagation. Um, so with those derivatives um, of that cost function, which let's say for now is a cross entropy, um, we can multiply the derivative um, of that cost function um, with, there's a, a little eta there, which is the learning weight. And then there's the, the deltas, um, which are, if you want, the, the weights. Um, and then these are also multiplied by uh, the output value, which is either y1, y2, y3. So in this case, we're able to um, modify um, the new weights um, with this collection of both learning rates, uh, errors, and derivatives with respect to the weighted sum of the inputs. So what's written on the left is, is the delta, it's the derivative of the cost function. Um, a DFDE is the derivative of the activation function, that's usually the sigmoidal one. So the cost function for this one uh, is some kind of cross entropy. And then YI is the output of each neuron. So this is essentially um, similar to that perceptron uh, formula, the delta rule, um, but with some modifications. Um, alpha in the perceptron rule is the same as eta here. Um, the derivatives with the activation function is similar to the derivative of the activation function in the perceptron rule, uh, where the difference is, is the derivative of the cost function. Um, which is used in the propagation step. Um, so we've moved from layers uh, one and two, and so this is again sort of the animation, animation of we're going backwards to the propagation and how uh, the different weightings are applied to those 
uh, essentially arrows and how things are modified. In each case, you could still, still see there's a eta, which is the learning rate, the delta, which is the error function, and then the activation function, which is the derivative. Um, and we take them relative to either it's DE, DFDE, or DFDF. Um, we multiply either by Y1, Y2, Y3, or we multiply by X, depending on where you are in the layer. So it's a relatively complicated bit of math, but it's essentially the way that all of these weightings are adjusted uh, so that things are modestly changed. Those changes uh, as we propagate through the, um, through the weight matrix and through the, the neural net essentially are changing um, the steepness um, of the activation function. So that's sort of, uh, as it moves to a step function, it becomes very steep. As it moves to sort of a shallow function, those are lower weights. And that's largely what we're doing is we're just changing how, how steep or how vertical or how non-vertical um, that step function is um, for um, um, essentially the, uh, the output projection. The idea of having biases is essentially a way of shifting um, this sigmoidal curve to the right or left. Um, the, uh, if, if we're trying to get an output of say 0.5 for an input of five, we can apply a bias of minus five. So this essentially allows us to scale to different numbers, uh, even though our sigmoidal function just ranges between zero and one. Um, the addition of the bias allows us to get um, um, to numbers that are non-zero and non-one. Uh, the learning rate, uh, so in the perceptron, that's alpha. In the nomenclature of artificial neural networks, it's eta. It looks like the letter N. Uh, again, it's, it varies between zero and one. And uh, you can adjust your bias where things might go down incrementally, very slow steps. Uh, if you have the learning rate that's too rapid, it just kind of bounces erratically before it can get to this minimum. Uh, ideally, with the concept of gradient descent, typically you, you move in big steps when it's steep and little steps when it's shallow. Uh, and so the middle curve is the example of how uh, you can adjust the learning rate and that you won't overshoot your, your minimum in terms of your cost function. Um, if we're looking at the math uh, for a, a neural net, uh, we can think of something where we've got some input vector, um, say two values, zero and one, that's the input. Then we have a weight matrix. Um, in this one, it's a two by three array. Um, so one by two multiplied by a two by three array generates a one by three array. So this is an intermediate calculation, um, but then that intermediate calculation can also be multiplied by a three by one array. Uh, so that produces an output of just a single number, uh, in this case, 0.13. So we could have our, our hidden, our, our matrices, our weight matrices. In this case, there's weight matrix one and weight matrix two. Uh, we have our input, which is at zero and one, and we have an output, which is 0.13. We can compare uh, or multiply that output through our activation function and determine, you know, is it close to zero or is it not? Um, and uh, we can compare to a desired output. Um, if that's off, then we go back through the back propagation, modify using those derivatives of the cost function, errors, um, derivatives of the activation function, um, and those change, they'll either increase or decrease the weights, uh, depending on the strength and um, relative importance. Uh, now we've got a new matrix, and we put in the same vector again and say, well, are we better? Uh, and we found that we went from 0.13 now to 0 0.062, so that's actually closer to zero, so we're getting closer. And then we repeat this cycle over and over uh, until we get to uh, a value. We can go on to another um, uh, new input instead of zero, one, it's now one, one. 
Uh, we multiply through everything again, and we see if this is actually better, and actually it's not quite the output we want. So we make some modifications, again, trying to make sure that it's going to be still able to handle the 0, 1 output. But now, I guess I should have changed this to 1, 1, uh, and we do the comparison. So we try our inputs, we try our outputs, just as illustrated in the, in the video, and eventually we converge to these two weight matrices. And these are the, the weights um, that allow us to take an input and predict an output uh, consistently. Um, so that's, that's all the effort of forward pack propagation, back propagation. It's really a lot of just simple uh, matrix algebra or dot products um, that are performed. This is another example um, illustrating the same thing that was shown in that video, where again, we've got an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. So we've got two values, um, the hidden layer, uh, three values, the output layer is one put. But in terms of the weight matrices, um, there's a two by three array and a three by one array. Um, the two by three array has the numbers like minus 0.3, minus 0.44, minus 0.43, and so on. The three by one array, uh, has values of minus 0.26, 1.11, and so on. And then the output. Um, so we have an input of two ones, and the output here is 0.73. And then we calculate what the error is uh, between the desired output, uh, which I guess, I don't know, maybe that was 0.19 or something. Um, and we measure the error. So it goes through and modifies the weights through back propagation as a forward calculation. And we can saw that it went from a, an error of 0.73 down to an output of 0.5, the error is now 0.5. Output is 0.49, the error is 0.32. We're going through various iterations of now our iteration 40, the error is getting smaller, the error is getting smaller. And finally, the error sort of converges and we've got a, an error of 0.11. Um, so this particular matrix or this particular neural network converged after 59 iterations. But you can see from this that there are changes. Um, whoops. Through these, where you can see the weightings um, keep on changing. So look at the middle and look at the right. The values keep on changing, some of them growing up, some of them not changing very much. Um, and by the time they are converging, most of the things have not changed, um, maybe only in the second decimal place. So this uh, is the result of, of the back propagation changing those weights uh, ever so slightly. Okay, so that's kind of the background and we'll just go through the same sort of process uh, where we're trying to classify using neural networks, uh, the iris data. Um, so it's the same six steps, define your problem, construct your data set, transform your data set, choose and train a model, test and validate the model, and then use it to start making predictions. So we've got our data set, we've got the iris flower data set that we had previously used, um, Versicolor, Virginica, and Setosa. Um, we're going to take a four fe features, which are the petal length and width, the sepal length and width, um, we're going to have this 150 samples, um, and it's about 105 uh, for the training and 45 for the test set. Uh, we're going to have an input layer, hidden layer, and an output layer. So we've seen the same data format uh, when we did this for the decision tree, same structure. Um, and now we're going to try and write the program. So we could write it from scratch, or since it's already been written, you guys can go to your machine learning um, site and module three, and you can choose the Python code because that's the one we're looking at. There is the R code. Um, if you're more comfortable with that, you can choose it. And once you've chosen the IRIS ANN for artificial neural network, that's distinct from the IRIS DT4, which is the decision tree. Now the general algorithm for the neural network is more complicated than a decision tree. There are similarities. We read the data, we check the data, we create our training and testing sets. So there's the 70-30 split. But then things start getting a little different. We have to do one-hot encoding. Um, so this is converting things um, so that it's, it's readable or converted into sort of an array or binary um, sets. 
We have to normalize the data. We do uh, what's called an L2 normalization of the um, petal lengths and widths and sepal lengths and widths. Um, we have to then encode the labels and uh, do the one-hot encoding. Uh, we have to define our activation function. In this case, we're using, I think, sigmoid for layer one and softmax for layer two. We have to initialize our weights and biases. These are kind of random numbers. Then we have to determine how many batches we're going to train. So we're not going to just train one batch. We're going to have several batches. Then we have to do the forward propagation from our randomized weights and biases. We calculate our errors from the neural net. And then we perform the back propagation um, to adjust them. And then we update our weights and biases and then re repeat this over and over and over again until the errors are minimized. So there's you know, about 15 different elements to a neural net. Um, as before with the decision tree, we import NumPy and Pandas. We also are putting in Seaborn and Matplotlib to help with some data visualization, um, which you'll see uh, a little later. But this uh, is an example of some of the libraries that we use just to make things a little easier for our computations. So like the uh, decision tree, we read our data. It's data one and it's a comma separated file. Uh, we use the same pandas uh, structure for, for reading the data and as, as reading them in, in matrices. We have the same data checking. Uh, we're just making sure that there's no missing data. Uh, so it's the same, same little piece of code that we used in the decision tree that we're also using in this one. So it's just good coding practice. So we're verifying the data set. Uh, now, after we've constructed and verified, we're just going to transform the data set. So the first thing is to separate between the training set, uh, which is about two thirds, so 105 flowers, and then one third, uh, or about 30 percent, uh, 45 flowers. And so this is just this bias where we've got um, two thirds training, one third um, for testing. Um, we have to convert uh, um, our flower data set into a set of a set of categorical uh, or rather binary values or numeric values. So um, we're taking what would have been uh, the list of the different flowers, whether it's Setosa virginica, another one that's Setosa, and we're going to classify them into this format where we produce the Setosa versicolor virginica. Uh, headers, and then we indicate with ones or zeros whether it's true or not true. And so in this regard, we can kind of encode the flower uh, status as a 100 or a 001 or a 010. And so that um, this three-digit code is a way of identifying um, what, what different uh, flowers there are. Uh, so we're not going to use SE, VE, or VI. It's, as I say, you're just converting it to ones and zeros. In this case, it's an array of three numbers. So we create our one-hot encoding uh, function. So it's called two one-hot, and then in the same, it just does what I was showing in that image there to create um, positions corresponding to the flower position or flower, flower name. As I said, in, in neural networks, you have to normalize. And in decision trees, we don't. Um, so this data transformation is to try and help with the scaling. We've got petal widths and sepal widths, numbers ranging from about 0.5 to like 10. And it's not exactly linear. Um, so what we're trying to do is normalize things. Um, so it's called feature scaling. L2 normalization is the same thing as calculating the distance between um, multiple points, uh, x squared plus y squared plus z squared, and take the square root sort of thing. Um, and the, the point is that the scaling helps to, to bring down uh, values that are maybe a little too high or a little too low. It, it makes the distribution, uh, I guess we'll say, a little more normal. Um, and so we can see L2 is the L2 norm, um, and we're calling this function normalize. Um, we're then going to um, take the data out from our data set and then perform that normalize on, on their data sets of, of the four by 550 iris uh, values. Um, 
We're also going to do the, the label encoding. Um, so we're now converting species from 0, 1, 2, and then we can also convert that through one hot encoding to uh, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, or 1, 1, 1, or whatever we have to do. Um, so this is the one hot encoding where we convert the 1, 2, 3 into 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. Um, there's a, an element in feature selection, which is mostly for um, things that you guys can do in your lab. So we're not going to really dive into that, but it's just allowing you to determine what elements to, to use. So we've now taken our data set. We've done some L2 normalization for transforming, making it, it normalized. This is a common mistake for a lot of people doing neural nets and other machine learning is that when they're dealing with numeric data, they don't, um, they don't normalize. As I say, with decision trees, you don't have to, but for just about everything else you do. Uh, the one-hot encoding is critical for uh, neural nets and other um, types of network models. Um, so we've seen how we've one-hot encoded things. Um, so as we use a neural net, we have to define this activation function. Um, the sigmoidal function is uh, very commonly used. Uh, it's this threshold that it sort of mimics a step function, but it's not a perfect step function. It's differentiable, um, which helps because we have to calculate derivatives, uh, especially for gradient descent optimization, which is used to minimize the error between the predicted and actual. Um, so this just describes or defines the sigmoidal function and also the derivative of the sigmoidal function. And as I said, the sigmoidal function is used for layer one. Um, we're going to use a softmax function for layer two, but this is just some math to remind people about the difference between a sigmoidal function, uh, which is sort of one over one plus e to the minus x, and the softmax function, which is sort of a, a similar, I guess, to the sigmoidal style, but it has, um, um, it's a sum of different uh, exponential functions. Uh, the differential, uh, the derivative of the sigmoidal function is essentially sigmoid times one minus sigmoid. Um, so that's one that you actually, you don't have to calculate the derivative. It's, it's known mathematically, so you can just um, put in the actual uh, function. Um, with um, the second layer of uh, this neural net, we have to use the softmax function. And so this, um, this describes the softmax function and it describes how you, it changes. It, it, it helps um, and it's more useful than the sigmoidal function if you're wanting to get outputs that sum exactly to one. Um, and that's, that's really useful for getting an output um, that will uh, sum to one. So, We've got our functions defined, uh, sigmoid for layer one, softmax for layer two. Layer two is trying to get an output that's going to you know, range from zero to one. We're going to initialize uh, our weights and biases in our, in our weight matrices. Um, and so these are typically random numbers uh, between zero and one. And so you can see how we've got the random functions called. In some cases, we've got a, a random set. Another one is a Gaussian random number. Uh, that we're using for the biases. So the biases can be uh, positive or negative. We're going to determine a bunch of batches. We know how many flowers we, we've got. Um, and this is just sort of trying to come up with a, a nice even number um, so that we've got, if there's 105 flowers, that we might have batches that are um, five batches of 21 each. So this is just doing the math to make sure we don't end up with a batch of uh, unequal numbers or a fraction or decimal. So once we've, let's say, broken up into five batches of 21 flowers as part of our training set, so that's five times 21 is 105, which is a 70% number. Um, we're going to go through this prop process of forward propagation, error determination, back propagation, update weights and biases, and repeat forward propagation, error determination, back propagation, update weights. And we'll do this for uh, batch one, batch two, all the way to batch five. And uh, then that's one epoch. And then we repeat that for hundreds, thousands of, of epochs or epochs. Um, 
We have a learning rate, which is remember the eta, the batch size, which let's just say it's um, five batches, um, and a number of epochs, which we can choose, or we can define that as what's the, the gradient or change gets too minimal and the, the, the algorithm stops. Um, so we have an input, which are batch sizes, learning rate, epochs, and then the output is the trained weights, uh, the new biases, and the training error measurements. So this is the meat of the neural network. Um, it's, it's the forward propagation step, which is what you saw with the perceptron, this, what we saw with the video. It's what I've explained before, which is We'll take a batch of, of things, uh, flowers in this case, and we figured out the size. We're gonna essentially do this first layer propagation where we calculate the, the matrix or dot product between the input uh, vector and the weight matrix. So it's a vector times matrix multiplication. And if you were not familiar with linear algebra, um, I guess <laughs> um, it might be a time to, to to study a little bit, but again, this is just simply um, multiplying a vector times a weight matrix. And we do this first for the first layer, and then we do it with a second layer. Um, and then we scale them by the sigmoid for layer one or the softmax for layer two. So we've done the forward propagation. Now we're gonna compare our output with the known output. So we're gonna calculate an error. So this is where we're looking at the batch labels or each of the labels and said, we predicted Setosa, but we actually, it's Virginica. So we're, we're wrong. And in case we're not using the word Setosa and Virginica, we're using 010001 as a way of assessing that. So we, we measure our output um, and compare them. Um, and um, we're going to calculate the uh, derivative of the um, cost function. And in fact, these ones for this particular thing actually end up being just simple differences. So it's not a partial derivative. Um, and then we're going to start modifying um, the weights um, based on this error that we've calculated. So as we go uh, from layer two to layer one is back propagation. Uh, we're again multiplying uh, the delta with this uh, derivative um, function. And then we also have, so there's the weight delta and then there's the bias for the delta. Um, so those are all being added together. And we go from layer two to layer one and from layer one to layer zero as we propagate the errors through this, um, this weight matrix. Um, and again, you're seeing, um, at least in, in terms of our annotation, uh, d cost, d-a-h, that's the delta, so the cost function. Uh, the d-a-h divided by d-z-h is equivalent to d-y, d-e, that's the error function that's sort of shown. So it's d-f, d-e, or d-y, d-e. Z-h is the weighted sum, that's equivalent to e. A-h is equivalent to y. So this is just sort of mapping the, the different um, I guess, letters or symbols to the ones that we were using in the previous previous model. But these are, again, we're just, we're, we're modifying in, in a directed, intelligent way how the weights should change um, to, to produce um, the best, um, best performance. And we're continuing as we go through the layer from layer two to layer one to now layer zero. Um, and now we're seeing layer one, we've got the error, layer one weights, delta, layer one biases, delta, and those are all determined from uh, the previous layer itself. Uh, again, we're getting this um, um, DAH, D cost, DAH, those are all being used in the multiplication. Um, so at this stage, we've done the back propagation, we can update all of our weights. Um, and uh, we're multiplying by the learning rate, which is uh, eta, or in this case, we're calling, calling it LR. Um, so LR equals eta, um, that Greek letter M sort of thing. And um, this is just illustrating how the, the weight is, is modified for both weight zero and weight one. 
we update the biases as well, a similar form, um, and again, we multiply by the learning rate. Um, and then all of these are put in from a, essentially a two-dimensional array into a one-dimensional vector, vector. So the entire process of essentially taking those batches and going from, uh, you know, in a, a whole bunch of epochs for the set, we see the same things where there's a first layer of propagation, second layer of propagation, uh, layer two error calculation, layer two derivative calculations, layer one derivative calculations, and then the weights and bias updating. And then we repeat over and over and over again uh, for hundreds or thousands of epochs um, until things converge. So this is this mix of forward back propagation um, weight adjustments. And what you see is that in this case, we're looking at a thousand training epochs. We start off with a, an error of maybe about 0.45, and then it starts falling, falling. And this is the error or the difference between the output and the true label. So in this case, these are the labels for the flowers, uh, whether you got Setosa or Versicolor or Virginica. And this we see the, with the training, uh, the error gets pretty small, um, almost minuscule. So unlike the decision tree, which is um, maybe about 90 lines long, um, uh, neural net is quite a long program, about 185 coding lines. There's 30 lines of comment. Um, it's relatively fast, um, partly because the data set is so small. Uh, we're just dealing with a 100, 150 flowers and their data set of four different measurements. Um, the program is configured so that it trains every time you run it. Um, so that adds a little bit of time, but because it's such a simple program, uh, you'll hardly notice it. So the algorithm in all its gory detail, uh, showing you, you know, all of the derivatives, um, the cost function calculations, the choice that we had to use with both sigmoidal and softmax functions to be able to make sure that the output was, you know, sum to one or um, all of those are, are details that most people would rather not know and typically don't have to know uh, for a neural net. And as we'll show you tomorrow, um, a lot of those gory details are handled through sort of simple uh, function calls. But, you know, this, this is, these are the guts of what a neural net is. And so it's, it's a fair bit of math um, and it's, it's math that's, um, I guess I'll say non-trivial. Uh, it's a mix of both derivatives, partial derivatives, uh, matrix multiplication. And if all of this sounds foreign to you, don't worry. Um, it's foreign to most of us. Um, but the intent is just to show you, um, you know, this is how it works. And for the most part, when you're trying to do machine learning, you can call these functions and they'll perform um, all the necessary tricks um, to, to do the the adjusted weighting and, and, and learning and back propagation. So once we've tested or trained on uh, initial set, we can then validate on our real data set. Um, we can um, take our training parameters and test uh, our training function and, and just test to see how things are, are doing. Um, so we can take, uh, this is the forward propagation, the test set, um, and how things are propagated to, to produce the, the final output. So here um, are the results of the training and testing. Um, so you recall, I think, at the uh, decision tree, we had a perfect performance uh, in the training set. In the neural net, uh, we don't quite have a perfect performance. We don't have the diagonal one, one, one. Uh, we have a slight error with distinguishing with Virginica and Versicolor. Then when we run the testing data set, so training sets 105 flowers, the testing set is 45, uh, we get a performance of one, one, and then 0 0.95. Now overall, um, the performance for prediction is roughly 97, 98% correct, both in the training and testing and that the performance between the training and the testing set is also quite comparable. So it's, it tells us that 
we've done sufficient training, um, that it's not overtrained, uh, it's not overfitting, and so we can be comfortable that the model is, is robust. I've compared the uh, DT script, the decision tree, with the neural net. Um, and you can see that they're about the same. Arguably, the neural net's a little better than the iris in terms of uh, when it comes to seeing new data. And that's maybe not entirely unexpected, given that neural nets are a little more sophisticated than decision trees. But um, that's probably more just a statistical noise artifact. So uh, both, I would say, are equivalent. And, um, and that just underlies the, the power of decision trees um, or random forests. Um, but neural nets are, are good for plenty of other things that decision trees don't do well. This is just a comparison between the Python version and the R version. Um, and um, you can see the R version is a little longer, the R is a little slower. Um, but that's typical for R. So um, what we've shown is sort of the guts, all the guts of a, a pure Python program to predict um, iris classes using an artificial neural network. Um, it is fairly generic code. Um, so we could have actually uh, applied it to other types of problems, just like we did the decision tree. Um, and essentially, as we go to the lab now, uh, we're just going to go through some examples. So I'm going to just dive right in because I know we've got a sort of a limited time here. I just want to show and make sure that you guys can, can call up the IRIS ANN. Um, it's the same way that you called up the programs for module two. Uh, if you didn't or weren't able to get module two working, I'd invite you to try module two again. I think we've hopefully finished um, those ones. But it's the same way with the IRIS ANN. Um, you can look at the code again. You can try and see if you can interpret a little bit more about the, the logic if you want. You can talk with uh, Life and Louisa uh, about the specifics of the code. Like the uh, Iris DT one, you still have to upload the data. Um, so this is in the data CSV. So you can click on the little folder. Um, you can click upload um, or you can download the data on your computer and, and, and choose it. Uh, same running protocol, uh, you go to run all, uh, this will do the training, um, it will also run the test and also produce a confusion, and you can see if it matches what we got in the slides. Um, what you can do, once you've got this going, you can start playing around. Um, you can change the number of epochs, you can change the batch size, uh, you can change the learning rate, and you can see how it performs. Um, you can also optimize the epoch numbers and see which ones give you your, your best confusion matrix um, and which one is sort of the minimum number of epochs or combination of parameters that give you the best accuracy. 